Thanks for uh, joining us here this afternoon. My name is Bern Zukowski. My colleague to my right is Jeff Archer, and uh, we're glad you came for this session. Uh, this is, uh, we've been doing this session now for a number of years, and it's kind of adapted and evolved over the years. And um, we just call this ArcGIS Online Steps for Success, a Best Practices Approach. And we like to position this as this isn't like a step-by-step how-to, but just guidance and tips. There's no kind of black and white prescription for making your organization come alive and be successful. Part of it are human factors. Everybody's different. Everybody has a different kind of organization. So these are guidance and tips. But it is a discussion of best practices for you to consider, and we're going to have demonstrations and all sorts of stuff throughout here. We might even ask some of you to volunteer your organization homes. If they're up and running, we might do a little critique on them to see how good you're doing. How many people have lifted an ArcGIS organization already? All right, not so many. OK, good. Uh, how many of those are on premises? All right, everyone's, well, a couple of people. OK, good. Um, that gives us a good indication of where we are in the landscape, so thanks for that. All right, we're going to begin at the very, very top with just uh, getting everybody up to speed with some common terms that we often hear but might not clearly understand. So this conference uh, and Esri's technology is all about web GIS. And sometimes that seems to be a puzzling concept. So what really is that? Um, simply put, this is just the foundation of a modern GIS system. It's really nothing but a pattern or an architectural approach that's based on services. Now, when we say services in WebGIS, we don't necessarily mean the World Wide Web. We mean any services. So these services are just REST services that can come from your ArcGIS server or from the cloud or both. Most people live in a hybrid. Uh, the components of your WebGIS are connected by these services, and it uses a portal. And all of that can be implemented in the cloud, on-premises, or typically a combination of both. So the next question then is, what is a portal? And a portal is an essential component of a modern GIS. And it's really a destination. Uh, it's a framework that <clears throat> provides some tools for managing and using content that you have. It supports identity, so members log in through the portal. And as a result of the login, they're exposed to different content and have different uh, capabilities within the organization. The portal manages users and collaboration between users and even across organizations. And it supports a sharing model, which controls access to all of the things that you manage there. A portal also supports what we call a geoinformation model. And what is that? Well, that's really an abstraction of all of the data sources that you can bring in. So rather than worry about the vagaries and details of what's an image service versus a vector tile service, these are all abstracted into much higher level objects that are easier for all of us to understand and work with. These are the maps and the scenes and the layers. Now, the portal can be hosted in the cloud through ArcGIS Online, or you can host your portal on-premises using ArcGIS for server and portal for ArcGIS. And we're working on technology that makes cross-pollination between the two if you want to implement both uh, easier. So that's the basics of that. But most importantly, conceptually, the portal represents the center of your geographic information ecosystem. And that includes how you outreach to other departments and to the public, and how you collaborate across organizations. Your portal also represents your circle of influence. So part of what you leverage your portal to do is to increase the value of you as a GIS organization and the value of the data that you've been uh, very busy uh, creating and authoring and maintaining. And Web GIS is fundamentally important because it takes everything that we do and amplifies it. It makes it more pervasive. So typically, we work with ArcGIS desktop and server to create what we think of as a system of record. And really, that means is this is the meat and potatoes data that we need. It's the authoritative sources of information. Now, leveraging a portal and a geoinformation model, we can turn that system of record into a system of engagement. So we can engage other people in other departments. We can engage the public, decision makers. We can enable self-service mapping and all of those great things. And of course, along with that comes the ability to turn that system of engagement into a system of insight so that we can discover more things and leverage GIS in many different ways to gain insights about what we do. With that, I'll turn things over to Jeff. Thank you, Bernie. So yeah, the, uh, 
now that you kind of understand a little bit of the basics of why you know ArcGIS organizations and portals are important, that kind of content management aspect and that system of record, the system of engagement, that kind of obfuscation of a lot of the the really mundane details of like an ArcGIS server service, those are all really, really important uh, you know, data sharing and collaboration tools. And it's something that um, you know, we want to promote here in this, in, this, in this session and make sure that you guys understand when you go back. So uh, one of the most important things, in fact, we put it number one, uh, when you're implementing an ArcGIS online organization or you're modifying a portal to be specific to your, inter your uh, workflows in your organization, it really pays to do a little bit of work up front, and that is to establish the vision and governance. Um, understand the roadmap and what success looks like for your organization. So looking at the vision and governments, governance, you know, the first thing is to identify the right people. And for those of you that have gone through any kind of project management training or something like that, this will sound really familiar. Um, but one of the things we encourage people to do is to treat this like a project. Understand who the champions are, who are the people that can help you get things done, um, who are the stakeholders, who are the people that are going to care, what the final product looks like and how it works. Um, also, who is the audience? Who's going to be consuming the information that you're making available in the organization or the portal? And what are the information products that they'll need to help make their workflows more successful? So once you identify those things and you keep that list handy, as you go through, that makes it more easier to kind of discover what it is that they need. So what is the mission and the vision of the organization and the portal? What workflows will it support inside and outside the organization? So, and also, what are the deliverables? What are the information products? Do they need to just be web-based mapping applications? Are they not map-centric? Are they just location-based services? Uh, these are all questions that it's important to, to answer um, when you're thinking about you know, how the, the portal is going to be implemented or how the organization is going to be implemented and managed moving forward. And also, one of the things you might consider is establishing a uh, kind of a management team, a curator or a group of curators. And then form some sort of a committee where you can uh, meet on a regular basis or otherwise keep communication flowing back and forth between those champions, the stakeholders, and the audience, uh, and make sure that everybody's engaged in the system and uh, you have the information that you need to get to that uh, vision of success. Now, one of the things that we've kind of uh, seen other organizations do is, uh, you know, I'm thinking of the city of Austin. Uh, we, a lot of this came from our own experience in dealing with uh, customers that have implemented successful ArcGIS organizations. And uh, this is one of the things that they came back with was, you know, yeah, these are kind of basic project management ideas, uh, but don't forget them and don't take them for granted. Because uh, if you get certain, a certain way down the process of implementing an organization or a portal, and you've missed out on one of the stakeholders, and then all of a sudden they come in, and they've got a lot of ideas about what it's supposed to look like, you've just made a lot of extra work for yourself. So making sure that everybody's engaged in the process that needs to be engaged and that has skin in the game uh, really will pay a lot of dividends down the road. So you know, just to kind of reiterate, you know, communicate early, often, and well. Uh, communication is really key to being successful with your organization or the portal. Um, kind of figure out rough timelines, uh, prototype and test things before you roll them out. In fact, engage people that are going to be the consumers of those uh, information products or those services or the things that you're going to make available in the organization. Ask them to test them out and see how they work. And, and you can kind of work back and forth, make sure that you're providing something to them that's really useful. That's going to do two things. It's going to help them be more successful and make you look good. It's also going to get them engaged in helping you make the organization successful. Uh, both of those things are very important. And you know, most importantly, I mean, this is a, a big project in a lot of organizations, but be flexible, uh, adapt, and evolve. Um, try not to get too emotionally connected to some of the different little aspects of the organization or the portal. Um, be willing to work with people and uh, uh, work as a team to try to help make it successful. And I'm going to kick it back over here to Bernie. He's going to show us some neat tricks to uh, configure the home page. 
Okay, so the next step is you've met with people and you kind of have an idea about what you're going to be building and what your goals and missions are. And more importantly, you know who the champions are and who the curators of the organization might be, the administrators. So now it's time to configure your organization at home and establish the technology framework. So one thing that you're going to be considering is how you're going to implement this. And you need to think about this in a grander landscape. Uh, some of you might be using enterprise systems like SAP uh, or others that might need to be incorporated into this. Uh, some of you may not have ArcGIS server uh, and be, might be relying entirely on the cloud to do what you need to do. Most of you, I think, already have ArcGIS for server, so one of your steps is going to be integrating things from that. So uh, part of it is just kind of taking a little pause and thinking about the different things that you need to integrate and then deciding whether you're going to implement your WebGIS entirely in the cloud, entirely on-premise, premises, I should say, or a combination of both. And I typically remember or, or typically recommend that the cloud's a great place to start and think to start unless there's strong reasons why you definitely need to implement it on premises because that just, that's stuff that you have to worry about, infrastructure that you have to deal with. Your organization home is the most visible part of what you do as GIS organizations in this web GIS world. And people do judge books by their covers. So spending some time in crafting a nice looking organization homepage is kind of step number one. Even if it's going to be for internal use only, others will judge you and what you do and the veracity of your data by what they first see and what they first experience. And there's some nice examples of some uh, aesthetic looking uh, sites. We'll see that not all the really great aesthetic ones actually implement things really well and we'll poke some holes in there uh, as we go along. Uh, all of this is done by the administrator through the organization settings. So there's tabs that you step through, you configure the home page, uh, the featured content which is the gallery ribbon that displays uh, there and uh, besides that gallery ribbon you can uh, configure your organization's gallery, which is one of the links up at the top. You can substitute your own base maps instead of Esri, Esri base maps. You can custom uh, create templates, application templates, and mix and match those with Esri app templates. Configure utility services like geocoding. You might want to kick up your own geocoding service or not. And you also specify your security settings. All of this is done by the administrator. All of this is pretty well covered in the help. And really, these settings are kind of up to you to decide what makes the most sense. Now, groups are a fundamental building block for lots of things that we do in ArcGIS Online and the WebGIS ecosystem. Groups are building blocks for your organization, and they're also building blocks for collaboration within and between organizations. One of the things you're going to want to do is set up the initial building blocks for your organization to do things like set up the featured uh, gallery and the organization gallery and uh, templates and base maps. Yeah, there's also, you know, if you're lucky enough to be in an organization that has an organizational chart, um, I would encourage you to print that out and use that as a guideline for your first pass at creating the groups in your organization. Um, so for a city, for example, you may have um, you know, a public safety group uh, to support the police department. You may have a water wastewater group to support that department. Um, so you get the idea. You can go through and see um, who are the different people who are going to be, you want to have engaged in the organization, and then make an individual group for each one of those. And then you can cascade those down and you can actually organize things on a project basis or on a specific workflow basis. Uh, to support those organizations within those groups as well. So we're going to talk more about those kinds of groups in a subsequent session, how to kind of form the backbone and the framework for your organization. But um, these are the groups that are the building blocks for creating it. And let's take a look at a really good example. So this is the Minneapolis homepage. And I really like this homepage. I find it appealing. It's got some great information. It's got a nice introduction. It's welcoming. What they've done here is they've created using some uh, HTML, some little styling here, they've used some HTML to style their description to be more than just text. And there's blog posts on how to do this, but they've added some graphics here and some links. And what's really nice about this is that they've leveraged Esri content to help people figure out how to use what they have published through their homepage. So they're leveraging some of the how-to videos that Esri has, and uh, it's a very nice uh, layout. That's uh, a very good idea. I, I, I like this as well. I just want to point that out. I mean, they're, they're just embedding things that already exist and making them just easier to find right here on the homepage. 
They've also brought in their other universes, so they connect to their city's uh, public web page. So there's links directly from there. All these interconnect. Here they've used a map gallery on their public web page to expose some of the content that's in their organization. You'll recognize some of these thumbnails as the same that are on the organization featured gallery here. So they might even be leveraging that same group that builds this. They've also implemented open data, which uh, we highly recommend that you think to do. This enables you to reach a whole different set of users, and it's just a configurable app within your organization, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. So let's grade them on first experiences. Now this is the featured gallery, some nice branding. We'll talk a little bit more about that later as well. But here's where I would expect to have people find a great experience when they click on one of these. So let's see how the experience is. Okay, so this is using the public information template. I just recognize that. And it looks like we have a map of uh, Minneapolis wards and neighborhoods. And my first impression is, uh, there we go, there they are. So the wards and neighborhoods pop in. It looks like they've done a nice job of styling with their pop-ups and we've got links to more information. And I can click on the logo to get more information about the neighborhood association, which is kind of nice. So this is a, a pretty good example of leveraging one of the configurable app templates to uh, present some information to the public. You want to make these engaging of interest and you want to make sure that there's no stop signs or poor user experiences. Here it looks like they're using a story map. This is a story map journal. And it looks like it's about rental and housing in Minneapolis. Story maps are great for telling stories, but they're also really good for bread and butter, butter types of activities like communicating to the public about things like uh, housing and so forth. So I would uh, give um, Minneapolis a pretty good grade for evolving a really nice uh, website. And because of what I've experienced here, I'm thinking they've done a great job. And I'm thinking their data is good and authoritative, and I can, I can trust in that. Thumbs up for me. Hopefully this is a result of them being in the uh, session in years past. I like to think that anyway. Here's an example of a highly stylized organization home. In fact, you can't even tell that it really is an organization home. This is the Egno site. And um, I can tell it's still an organization home because of these tabs up on top, but they've done a lot of style overrides to kind of really customize it. There's lots that you can do. Uh, many of these are covered in blog posts, and you'll be able to find some other examples of that. Let's take a look at one more example. Let's take a look at, um, let's try Salt Lake City. And uh, so full disclosure, I'm a Virgo. People tell me that means I pay attention ad nauseum to detail, and that's me. And I'm not being uh, critical of, of these sites, if there's anybody from Salt Lake City here, but I'm just looking at ways that I would improve this. So the first thing I see is I have a featured gallery, but these are the default thumbnails that are that ArcGIS just kind of sticks in there. So already I'm thinking, boy, they didn't even take the time to change the thumbnail and make a better thumbnail for the things that they're featuring on their gallery. So already I'm thinking, ah, I don't know. And uh, as I go through here, yeah, boy, this is a, not a very good looking thumbnail here either. So I already am casting, I'm getting some impressions about what they're doing here based on what I'm experiencing. So I won't belabor the point here, but uh, the fact of the matter is people do judge books by their cover, and this cover isn't quite as good as the last one that we looked at. And um, the other thing to consider is that these sites are not necessarily for public access, so you can embed what you have in your organization in lots of other ways. Uh, embed them or push them out in open data sites, use some of the group gallery templates to expose them, and you can use those gallery ribbons and embed them in your own city website. Here's the city of Redlands, which I don't find a particularly attractive website, but what they've done is they've taken some of their maps and used a group gallery ribbon and embedded that on the, on the home page. And you do that uh, by sharing a group and then looking for embed. Those are the tools for that. And the Minneapolis site did the same thing. I don't know if you noticed that when Bernie clicked on that before. It went to a city web page and they had another gallery kind of embedded in there. Um, it's an important point because sometimes it's like, well, this is the tool we have, let's use it. And uh, we just wanted to make sure that you guys are aware there's other options to get this content into other web pages. Uh, you're not limited just to the, to the default home page that we give you, although it, it can work for a lot of situations. So here's the group gallery ribbon from uh, Minneapolis embedded in their public web page. Good practice, and uh, we recommend that. Um, the other thing you can look at for setting up your organization and building apps are the solution templates. They're kind of industry or domain focused. Those include not only configurable applications that are domain tailored, but also 
suggested layouts for your organization, what kind of groups you should think about, and even things like graphics and logos that you can use as you build your group. These are available at solutions.arcgis.com. Uh, from there, you just go ahead and browse for your industry, whether it's emergency management or whatever it happens to be. You'll find some app templates that you can download and use and lots of resources uh, that are available. So these are really helpful. Even if you've already started your organization, uh, lots of people kind of overlook these. So it's a great resource to go back to and make sure that you've considered. There's lots of really interesting applications. This one is uh, really quite popular. This is a kind of a photo survey and it's meant to allow people to capture things out in the field with photographs on devices and to bring that back into the organization. Uh, one final example, uh, Boston Maps has just recently updated their site. They've styled it with a flat look, so they've used some style overrides and they've added some nice links to their open data story maps. They've got some really good featured apps and they also have some really good branding using that B logo. So this is a very appealing site, gives the visitor a really nice uh, experience with lots Lots of interesting information products that they can enjoy and uh, use to learn more about Boston. And one thing I mentioned uh, additionally about those templates is don't limit yourself. So just because it's the Defense and Intel template, don't think, oh, there's nothing in there I can use. Because uh, each one of those templates has a lot of really interesting, say, just like the graphics that you can use to style a thumbnail. We'll talk about that a little bit more later. But each one of those templates has its own little set of tools. And even though it's stylized maybe for defense and intel, you might find something in there that's really useful that you can kind of pluck out and put into your own organization. All right, and with that, I'll uh, turn things over to Jeff. Now, the kind of logical next step to a lot of what Bernie went through with uh, setting up a successful homepage is what we refer to as establishing your brand. And one of the things, uh, basically what we mean by that is kind of giving people a visual cue that says this content is authoritative, it gives me a lot of confidence that it came from somebody who knows what they're talking about, and you know, now I know uh, this isn't just some Yahoo uh, intern somewhere who published this information, this is really coming from a good source. Um, so this is a pretty good example um, for Kansas, and you'll notice here that they've got uh, in that public information gallery, you can see at a glance that you know, it's got the nice Kansas logo embedded there on the, on the thumbnail, and it's got a nice title across the top, so I don't have to, there's no guesswork as to if, is this a layer, is this a map, is this an application? Uh, they've got all that kind of nailed there. Now here's another example. Um, from uh, Greensboro, South Carolina. Now these guys are Greenville. Greenville. Sorry, not Green Greensboro is North Carolina. Greenville, South Carolina. Uh, so Greenville has done a really good job in kind of coming up with this uh, this brand image. That's this G with the kind of river thing flowing out of it. Uh, just a really nice icon that they use throughout all of their uh, web presence, both on their web pages and also in their ArcGIS online organization. And when you look at this, you know I can tell at a glance, man, this is from you know, city of Greenville, I know that this is good content. And you also see things like from, uh, I believe this is from UDOT, that's a tiny little uh, graphic there, uh, Draper City, snow removal, sorry. So at a glance I can tell that this is an application, uh, it's been marked as a kind of a green all, uh, that probably means it has access to everyone, it's a public facing application. Uh, just some, again, some visual cues and, you know, this can also, you know, as GIS people, we wear a lot of hats, right? We're database administrators, we're coders, we're web developers, we're all kinds of stuff. And one of the things that we encourage people to think about is the graphic design aspect. So when we say establishing a, van a brand, and specifically here we're talking about a visual brand, so that, you know, uh, Greenville logo is really cool. Um, you can also see the same thing for Boston Maps. And then also we've had, uh, I believe this one uh, Bernie had made up for his kind of sample organization. And this is kind of an indication that this is for transportation, all right? So it's a visual cue. There might be a whole set of these things, all kind of styled the same, uh, that you can use throughout your organization to establish that visual brand. Now another thing you want to spend a little bit of time on to give people that confidence that they need in the, in the data that you're publishing uh, is an organization profile. Now, one of the things that we're looking at here uh, is kind of a couple of different examples of what a good profile looks like and maybe what a not so good profile looks like. So if I'm looking at information from the Kansas Department of uh, Transportation, I can see here in the description that it says this is the official ArcGIS.com account for GIS content, but 
you know, they haven't even gone to the trouble to put a picture in there or any kind of, uh, in, you know, this doesn't give me a lot of confidence. It's just, you know, the verbiage is there and I know I should believe it, but man, it's just not really grabbing me. So, whoops. If we look at another example, uh, the city of Greenville has put that nice logo on there and this looks, you know, just adding something like an image can make it look much more professional. And at a glance, you know, this gives me a high degree of confidence. This is the official RTS.com account for GIS content published by Greenville, South Carolina. So I can look at this and I can know that this is coming from an authoritative source and I can trust it. And I'll kick it back over to Bernie for some demo. All right, so let's take a look at how these organizations did. This is that uh, KDOT organization. I really like it. I love their branding on their thumbnails. It's very easy uh, for me to understand that this is from an authoritative source. Why is that important? Well, if I'm up here and I'm looking for, let's look for a KDOT reference layer or something, uh, I type in that search, uncheck the box to search outside my organization, and boom. I know exactly, without even reading anything, which I can expect to be the authoritative sources. Also, what's important is, who is this user, CanDot? Ah, CanDot is the official ArcGIS.com account. So I know that this is authoritative data, this is first-tier stuff that CanDot is making available to me. So that's a really great example. Uh, let's take a look at another example. Let's use uh, Greenville. So I search for Greenville, and uh, here's what I find. And uh, boy, I'm not sure what this first thing is. I don't like that thumbnail, not sure about that. Oh, here's a logo. I recognize that Greenville logo. It's published by G Straight something. So let's see who he is. No idea. Um, is he an intern? Is he, I mean, I don't know. But already I'm thinking, ah, the logo attracted me to this, but I'm not sure this is authoritative content. But as I scroll through here, let's see, let's go to, let's go to Maps and see if we can find something a little more authoritative. Um, okay, here's another Greenville logo. Oh, and this is published by the City of Greenville, South Carolina GIS. So just kind of by browsing, I'm thinking this is the more authoritative content and I can click on other items. So to do this, what you need to do is you need to use one of your user accounts specifically as your public facing organization user. So we've created a user or they've created a user called City of Greenville SCGIS. The administrator probably curates the data when the maps are great, when the apps are great, they probably transfer ownership from the author into this kind of public facing persona that represents the authoritative uh, uh, information. And that's what we recommend. And with that, uh, let's uh, move on and talk about organizing your organization. So groups, as we've mentioned before, are not only a framework for building your organization, but they're also the backbone of how you're going to support your departments, how you're going to support your projects and workflows. And the solutions templates offer some thumbnails and some guidance for how you might construct these or how you might organize these. Now, Jeff also mentioned that a lot of people take an org chart and just circle the different pieces that are the first participants in the organization and make sure that there's groups there that represent those interests. Uh, something that you need to consider also is that the worst experience is when someone goes into a group that's designed for them and they see nothing. So one of your goals as an administrator lifting an organization is going to be to pre-populate these groups with great maps, great layers, great applications which help that department or help that project achieve what they need to do. Uh, groups also control access to various things, access to resources. So you can lock down things within a group so only members of that group can see it. You can elevate that up to your organization so everybody in the organization can see it and of course share it publicly. Uh, these groups are really handy for, as collaboration nodes within your organization and you can also set up groups that invite membership from other organizations so they serve as a collaboration node as well. Now we've done some interesting things with groups recently. One of the problems that we faced uh, was in the EOCs, emergency operation centers, where they might have to run 24 by 7. Maybe you've got 24 by 7 departments. So John would go home for the day, Jeff would come in on the second shift, and oh, he'd have to uh, update one of John's maps or apps. 
Well, what that would mean is uh, Jeff would need to own it to update it, so the admin would need to have to transfer ownership, and it was a big headache, lots of management uh, issues. So what we've done is we've enabled you to make groups where you can allow the members of the group to edit each other's content. So as people come in for the next shift, they can just take over and edit and keep going with what they need to do. Now one of the things I like to do is when I'm building out organizations is I use visual cues. I don't like to read text, I just like to look at something and understand. So I've adopted cues that are just graphic in nature. So I use certain graphics consistently for all of the building blocks for the organization. And I use different colors or other graphics to indicate uh, project or theme based uh, activities. Let's uh, take a look at one of those real quick here. Uh, this is an organization I've been working to lift called Civic Analytics. And if we take a look at the groups I've constructed there, the ones that are logoed in red are the building blocks of the organization. So that's the featured gallery and other things. The ones that are in green are focused on geography. So here's some Boston maps and Chicago maps. And the ones that are in purple are theme based. So already without having to read a lot of words, I can just kind of open up all these groups and I can already zoom in to the things that I want to get at. So visual cues I think are really handy and a great shortcut, especially as you get lots of these. And again, uh, populating these with content so that the experience is good is uh, also very important. When you invite users, uh, you can uh, make sure that they get inserted into groups and you can set up groups in different ways so that they're private, people can petition for access, uh, or they're only by invite only. And you can also control how people contribute. Only people that are members of the group uh, or members of the group can contribute or only the owner of the group can contribute. So there's lots of uh, different things that you can do when you uh, author the group, when you create it. Um, when you use uh, items in the group, uh, you can open any item, any public item or any item within your organization. When you click the share button, you can sort of bin them or put them in the folders, if you will, put them into these groups to organize that content. So that's one of the things that you will do. There's lots of great public content out there. So one of the things that you might do is do the exercise that we just did. You look around your surrounding communities or identify content from Esri that you like. You find it, you share it into groups within your organization so that it's easy for people in your org to access and find it. So that's a, that's a big step. Favorites is kind of a little specialty thing. It's a user by user thing, but it's a handy way to favorite maps and other items that you want to use uh, frequently. So here's how you favorite. When you find the item, you just click at the bottom and it adds it to the favorites and it's kind of simple because favorites, your favorites, this is a user by user thing again, uh, is one way to filter for content. So I use this a lot when I'm building applications or story maps. I favorite the things I want to use in there so I can find them very, very easily. And I think with that, uh, I'll just turn it over to Jeff. Sounds good. So now that we've gotten through the first four steps and we've established a vision and governance, we kind of know what success looks like, we get people engaged, um, we create a nice looking home page. Um, we establish a nice looking brand and we've organized the organization in groups that kind of match our, uh, that list of governance, the stakeholders, the, the uh, consumers of the, of the content. Now we're actually getting into uh, what most people actually considered the first step, I think, before uh, this, this session or before kind of thinking about things is adding useful content. And it's, it's really temp tempting to kind of jump right into the organization and start adding stuff. Um, and that is an important part of it. Um, but one of the things we want to kind of make clear is what are, what are some of the uh, things to think about as you're adding this. And one, of the, one thing is you're certainly not uh, limited to any Esri uh, corporate, you know, like just ArcGIS server services or uh, just maps or just geoprocessing, uh, nothing like that. You can, you can add anything to a portal. Um, so we've actually used them uh, internally on my team to host images that we use in other web pages. So you can just upload something that's just a Word document or an image. You can give it a description. You can put uh, tags and keywords in so somebody can search and find that. Uh, and then you get a publicly hosted URL that you can use in pretty much anything you can imagine. Uh, so it's a pretty interesting and useful content management tool. Uh, now one of the things that we see here you know, people have added 
uh, CSV files, Word documents, toolboxes, you can see that there's a little visual cue of what that is. And this gets back to kind of that idea of creating good thumbnails. And we'll talk a little bit more about that here in just a minute. Those are kind of a pain in the neck to keep on maintaining just because you've got to do each one of these by hand. So and practically speaking, you're not going to do this for everything. But your top tier content or most used content, it's kind of useful to certainly think about making visual cues like this. So one of the other things that we like to encourage people to do is to kind of uh, rethink or I guess uh, more accurately reorganize your existing services. So it can be really tempting to you know, kind of take a kitchen sink approach to services and maybe Esri's been guilty in the past of encouraging people to do that with ArcGIS Server and other uh, web-based tools. Uh, because you know, you say, oh, put everything in there and just query out what you need for the different ap application. Well, that can be confusing for somebody who's coming at this, uh, trying to navigate, discover content, and put it together into something useful in your organization. So maybe you can take that one gigantic service and maybe break the layers out into things that are more focused. Uh, one more focused on bicycles, for example. So anything having to do with bicycle routing, parking. Another thing having to do with uh, transportation specific to bridges. Uh, and another thing with construction projects. So try to kind of find logical ways to organize the services into smaller entities and not just one gigantic uh, service. Now with that said, um, ArcGIS Online organizations and portal are a boon to anybody that's got ArcGIS Server. Uh, for anybody that's gone to the, to the REST endpoints for ArcGIS Server services, they're pretty dry. Uh, there's a lot of information on there, but it's not really organized in an effective you know, user interface. Uh, and it can be kind of difficult to organize and search if you have a lot of those services together. So ArcGIS Online really solves that problem. Um, and the first step to getting uh, the most out of these services is just adding them as items in your organization. And if you've done your due diligence with uh, metadata and attributing those services, that information just comes right through. And we'll look at that in a demo here in just a little while. Um, and the other cool thing you can do is use that information to style pop-ups. So you can actually configure the service to be ready for use when somebody embeds it into a web application or a mobile application, or if they're just viewing it in the web map in your organization. Uh, you can actually pre-configure all of that so when they identify something in the service, they get a nice clean uh, pop-up with the information that they're interested in, not just a bunch of uh, GIS mumbo jumbo. So the uh, third step after you've added the service and configured it is to actually save that as a layer and that makes it a really ready to use entity in your organization. So another thing you might want to do is to prevent deletion. Uh, we've all been here, right? Uh, where's undo? Where's undo? Oh my god. So you delete something, uh, especially something that's not yours, that can cause a lot of problems. Uh, so you know, this is uh, just one of the settings that you can put in there to, to make sure that that uh, doesn't happen. Now another thing you want to do is to make your content discoverable. Uh, you can embed that into groups. Uh, you can add the really cool stuff to your organizational galleries. Uh, kind of put it front and center for people to discover. Uh, this might be useful, especially if you're supporting different departments within an organization. Maybe that department has uh, you know, certain data layers that they use on a daily basis. You can just make those available kind of front and center by using a group and presenting that to them. Now a word here about thumbnails. Um, here we're looking at a lot of uh, uh, different ones, but you know, generally speaking, don't use the default thumbnail. Um, that is generated by you know, the robots that work in ArcGIS Online basically to give you something other than that little blank picture. But it's not very descriptive, generally speaking. Um, and for something like uh, you know, looking at the, the one in the top center, I mean, how do you make any sense of that? I mean, how do I know what that is? I think that is kind of Montana, but I have no idea what's involved in that map. So one of the things you can do is to try to uh, provide hints, visual hints in the, in the thumbnail. And that could be as simple as just like making the thumbnail center on the area where the data is relevant to. Uh, so here we're looking at some location-based hints. You can also do things that are graphical hints. Uh, so if it's a Department of Fish and Game, you know, I see the, the game-based hint there. I can tell the middle one is probably about weather in some capacity. And you know, the one on the right is about wine. Uh, pretty straightforward. You can also use content hints, and we've seen examples of this throughout the presentation already. 
uh, you can see uh, what looks like to be obviously a traffic um, content there. Uh, you can see, uh, again, I'm not sure what that middle one is. It looks like maybe transportation routes or, or something uh, to that effect. And then also we see the Excel spreadsheet on the right, very obviously an Excel spreadsheet. And you can kind of blend those things together um, to give the user at a glance a really good idea of what it is that he's going to find if he clicks on that, uh, that uh, icon. Plus include your organizational brand there. That's a good branding. Uh. Excellent point. This is a very strong place to uh, keep your brand going. And after you save and before you share, there's some uh, things that you should go through as a little checklist. Make sure you have a good, good thumbnail. Uh, when someone looks at the description page, uh, you want them to be able to see something that's very intuitive as to what that is. A great description um, tells them what they're going to look at. A concise summary, not something that's a, you know, a mini novelette that somebody's going to have to read to figure out what's behind the, uh, the curtain here. Uh, just something really to the point, this is what it is. And then also use good tags, uh, usage notes, make it easy for somebody to be able to discover this. Now you can write this uh, down on a, in your notes and we encourage you to do that, but one of the things that we've actually provided that is an extremely useful tool for anybody who's managing a, a portal or an organization is the Living Atlas Contributor app. Now what this application does is it analyzes the content that you add to your organization and it tells you how you've done with all of those above points that we just went through. And it grades your content um, on a scale and it says, well, you did a pretty good job with the thumbnail, but you didn't do so good on the description. And this is a way to kind of run your a sanity check, if you will, on your content to make sure that you've done what needs to be done. Or even better yet, somebody else who's publishing information to your, to your organization or your portal is doing what they need to be doing to get that shared out to everybody else in the organization. And I'm going to kick it over to Bernie, and he's going to walk us through some of that stuff real quick. So let's start with that uh, contributor app that Jeff just mentioned. So this is really designed as a tool for people that want to contribute their content to the Living Atlas. And we have certain standards that we want people to adhere to, so this app was built to support that. But even if you don't want to contribute to the Living Atlas, you can use this application. It's at livingatlas.arcgis.com slash contribute or you can just kind of search for that or go to the Living Atlas website and find it, and you'll find this app. You click the Nominate button and you enable the app to look at your items, and once you do so, it starts analyzing and listing all of your items. So this is everything that's in my organization. So you can see some of this, uh, there's some bad thumbnails and things like that, uh, but let's just go ahead and click on one of these. So let's click on this one and I get a little preview and I get a content score. I can actually explore the uh, map a little bit, but the required score for submission to the Living Atlas is 80, and I've only managed 55 out of 100. So how can I improve that? Well, the things outlined in red are things that I can improve, and I can look over here on the, on the left. So I've gotten four out of nine points for my thumbnail. Um, actually, I think I deserve better because I'm using great organizational branding and some location hints, but kind of the automated process only gave me four out of nine, but it does give me some hints on how I can improve that. I've gotten eight out of eight for the title, eight out of eight for the summary. Uh, the description uh, apparently didn't pass muster. So I've got some hints here about how to do um, better with that description. Uh, it also analyzes tags. I didn't add any tags. It looks at whether or not I'm using uh, credits. It looks at uh, various settings, uh, including sharing, how many layers are in the map. Lots of really great information, including ah, did the person that submitted this provide a good profile? And in this case, I got a good profile. So even if you're not submitting something to the Atlas, this is a really handy tool for you to use to look at your content to kind of up the bar on that. Now let's step back a little bit and let's talk about ArcGIS for Server. Now many of you use ArcGIS for Server and I often say that ArcGIS Online is Esri's gift to you because it just allows you to take those services that you've created and let them play in this web map ecosystem. So it allows you to unlock the potential of what you've crafted. It can be used in many, many different ways. It can be used for self-service mapping, all these great things. You're not moving your data. You're not 
uh, moving your services, you're just registering them in your organization so that others can discover and use them, make web apps with them and story maps and things like that. So let's talk about how to do that. I'm at a services directory in ArcGIS Online right now, and let's uh, drill in a little bit further and look at one of the demographic ones. This is the USA Diversity Index. So I choose that, and the way that I add these is I can just sort of grab the URL and I can add that URL to my organization, which is what I'll do, but before I do that, let me show you something else you can do. This has actually three, uh, four different sublayers. If I only wanted to add one of the sublayers, I could go to the sublayer level and I can copy and paste that and add it as an item. So you can kind of break things down at a more granular level if that's what you want to do. But I'm going to take this top level and I'll just copy that and we'll go to my organization. Go to my content. I'm going to add an item from the web. And we'll paste that URL and click. And all of a sudden things start populating because whoever crafted this did a really good job. They've got some uh, great information here. It's already been able to pull in some information from that. Now I might, uh, I think, in my opinion, this is over tagged. So I would uh, actually get rid of this. When you tag things, you don't need to tag with words that are already in the description or already in the title or summary because they're already searchable. So you might want to use more specific tags. Uh, let me just add a word here so I can discover this later. And let's add the item. So now it's generating a thumbnail. And in this case, I know it's created a pretty good thumbnail. So it's done a really good job. I don't even need to change that. It's pulled over the description from the services directory. And already I'm, I'm kind of ready to go. But not yet. There's an important step that I need to take here, which is I want to configure this so the user experience is good. So I will open that in the map viewer and let's take a look at what we have. Um, as I zoom in, I can see we have a, a multi-layer, I've got some sub-layers here, here's counties, and as I zoom in, there's uh, other more detailed layers. But when I interact with the map, I don't get any pop-ups or anything. Um, so one of my first tasks is gonna be to configure that pop-up. In this case, because there are sublayers, I would need to do this for each of the sublayers. But we've got counties here. Let's go ahead and configure the counties. So I'll come in here and say enable the pop-up. And now at least I have a display of information. But, internet be willing, uh, this display of information isn't the best, right? We've got stuff that doesn't make sense to most mere mortals. We've uh, got some funny names here. We've got a bunch of numbers. We can make this much, much better. So one of the things I can do is just configure that pop-up. And of course, uh, one of the ways is just to be able to pick and choose which things I want to display. I can create uh, different aliases for these things, remove uppercase letters and things like that, control decimal precision of display. So that's one thing I can do. Or a really interesting thing to do is to use a custom attribute display, which uh, is kind of one of my favorites. Uh, so here, this allows you um, to add regular text with attributes. The name of this uh, county is, and then we'll choose the county name. Um, and uh, the population here is, and we'll choose the population. There we go. And we'll add a period. Dink. And let's uh, go ahead and bold some of this. We'll make this uh, bold. And we'll also make that uh, bold red. I get the idea. We can kind of uh, do this uh, pretty easily. And we end up with a much better little display of information uh, once that pop-up appears. So it's a combination of natural text and attributes. And what's in the curly braces is being pulled as attributes. So each of these will be unique. So it's pretty easy to create some better pop-ups. Now, what I also want to do is I want to make some better sense out of all those numbers that we saw. So let's go back in and configure the pop-up. And let's add a pie chart. And this is a bunch of information about diversity. So I am going to compare the white population to Hispanic, uh, American Indian, Asian, Pacific, and uh, other race. Um, yeah, I think that's it. And click OK. And now not only do I have a better uh, display of attributes, but I've also pretty quickly configured a nice little pop-up, which will come up here in just a moment. So very quickly, we've turned that dump of GIS attributes into something more meaningful. So I'm done. Not really. Almost. Almost. So 
I've registered the service, people can find it, but I don't want them to have to configure all this stuff. I want to give them a really good experience when they're using this right off the bat. They can override what I do, but I also want to make sure that they've got a good default experience. So this is now an item, it's a layer item in my organization. To preserve everything that I've done, I click Save Layer. Now anybody that uses this layer will have that nice pop-up. I can you know, symbolize it differently, do whatever I want to do, but they've got a great user experience right off the bat. So ArcGIS server users, this is the process you're going to take to register your services and make them imminently more usable. And I think with that, I'll turn it back to uh, Jeff. All right, thank you. Uh, yes. All right, now... Uh, uh, actually, we're on number six. Are we on number six? Yeah. Actually, I think. It was oh, you just wrapped up number six. Oh, uh, did I? No, I didn't. Oh dear. We're having some discussion. Okay, I'm on number six. I think it's me. You're on number six. I'm on number six. All right. We get confused sometimes. All right. Um, we've you've registered your services. You've added other things and published them as services. Now, what you want to do is create those really, really useful and compelling information products, as we call them. They're really applications. A uh, great app starts with a great map, and one of your first steps is going to be to build great maps, and this includes everything from configuring great pop-ups to leveraging all of the different capabilities in styling to make a great-looking aesthetic map. When you marry a map with an application, it just completes the information experience for the user. A lot of these applications are generic just for ad hoc exploration. Others are more task-focused. Even others, bring in additional content or capabilities. So for example, we have a terrain profile application template which pulls in a terrain model underneath your map so that you can derive terrain profiles by drawing on it. Uh, the one, uh, the public information map provides connections to social media. So you can add uh, Instagram photos or uh, tweets and things like that, and that's built into the application itself. So uh, each application is different. They all uh, are meant to solve uh, some different uh, problems, and some of them might include additional capabilities or data. Now, a lot of people use the map viewer to share their maps with others, but I think we'd recommend thinking different about that. Don't do that. Uh, the map viewer is actually an authoring tool. And it's okay for sharing with others, but it's so easy to leverage one of the other templates so that you can share things with others and provide a better experience than that provided by the map viewer. So there's many different ways you can do that. Use story maps, use some of the other configurable apps, and it's just really, really easy to do that. The configurable apps are built into the sharing uh, workflow, and you're presented with a series of dialogues, and you just kind of check the boxes or provide the inputs to what you want, and you've got a custom configured application. For those of you that want to take these templates a little bit further, they're all available in source code. They're in GitHub repos, they're zipped up in files. You can download them, and you can work with them uh, uh, individually. And I'll even add, like, uh, if you really want to nerd out, you can actually make your own templates. So if you have an application that maybe you had a contractor you developed in internally, uh, there is a, a template that's available on GitHub that allows you to templatize virtually any JavaScript API application. Uh, so you can then make that uh, something you could reuse in your organization when somebody creates a new web map. That would be one of the template options that they have as they go through the, uh, the share dialogue in ArcGIS Online. Uh, now that's a pretty advanced use case and not everybody's going to want to do that. I uh, just wanted to make that, make that clear that it is an option if it's something you want to do. So I'm a mere mortal, not a demigod like Jeff. The <laughs> easiest way for me to create configurable application templates is to use Web App Builder. So that's one of the unique things about Web App Builder that's totally cool. Uh, we'll cover Web App Builder in a second, but if you're looking to create custom templates, you might want to build your own custom template gallery for your organization. The easiest way to do those is to use Web App Builder, create the app that you want, and there's a button that you click, and it downloads the code, and it is a configurable application that you can host and insert into your organization. So let's just take a quick look at some of these uh, things that we've just talked about, and Jeff might have to remind me kind of what it is that we covered. Let's start with this. Here's my, uh, my map here of the U.S. Let's go ahead and save this. And uh, this is going to be my diversity uh, map. And we'll add a tag. 
and uh, now we're ready to go to save the map. Now I need to make some decisions about how I want to share it. So of course I go to the share dialog and we're going to make a public map with this. So I click public and now there's a couple of really interesting things I can do. But hey, what's this? A little message. Ah, so when I shared it publicly, it discovered that one of my layers, there's only one layer in here, uh, wasn't shared at the same level and it's checked that for me. Do I want to update the sharing of that uh, layer the same as a map? Yes, because otherwise the user would be prompted to authenticate. Once that's handled, there's a couple of really cool things I can do here. Uh, one thing is I can take this map and embed it in a website. And uh, with this, I just kind of toggle the different options that I might want. Let's uh, include a base map gallery and maybe a legend. And I've got some HTML that's being generated for me here. And all I need to do to put that in my website is to copy and paste that. I think we can do that real quick. Uh, I've actually got a, um, let's see, here's a, not a very exciting web page, but it's a web page. And I want to put a map in it and make it a little more exciting. So I've got a little local host running here so I can test things out. And I've got a little sample website, which is a fixed width website, which is what we've just opened up. And let's uh, open that notepad and let's scroll down here underneath some of the text. And let's hit carriage return and let's paste that web map in there. Uh, so there we go. Let's just go ahead and save that. File, save. And let's go back to the browser and let's refresh that. And uh, there we go. I've got a little web map in there. I kind of goofed it on the uh, sizing there. Uh, but I've got everything I configured, including a little base map gallery. So it's really easy to leverage these information products in bunches of different ways. And I've got a little uh, something happened there because I must have pasted wrong because I've got some of the HTML up there. It's probably why it does the size. Anyway. But this workflow is actually really common. So you may have people request, uh, you know, maybe from the GIS department or another department, we need a map to embed in a, you know, a corporate web page or an organizational web page of some kind, or somebody just requests that. Maybe it's a local newspaper. Um, this allows you to generate that and just send somebody an email with stuff that they just need to paste into the HTML, and there it is. All right, let's see if I've managed to correct that. And if I haven't, uh, I haven't. Oh, well, okay. But you get the, the idea. Virgo and Bernie really <laughs> wants to fix that. <laughs> Copy and paste and you're good to go. Let's go back to the diversity map and let's share it in a different way. We're going to do that in a, in a configurable template. And there's lots to choose from. You choose them by category by clicking here on the left. When you find one that you like, you select it. Your boss says, hey, I want that quick map of U.S. demographics. Can you send it to me? Your tendency will be to send them the URL for the map viewer, but you can just open it up in one of these simple templates, click preview, and just share this link with them because it doesn't expose them to some of the things that the map viewer has, plus it gives them all the other tools that he might want, like a print. Uh, he's still got some of the other default tools. This is the default configuration for this template, but it's an easy way to quick share with someone if you need to. So that's a, a nice little hint for you. Otherwise, we're going to configure the web app, and I do that by giving it a new name. Uh, let's see, uh, app, that'll be uh, not very exciting name, but good enough for now. Okay, so once I do that, I marry the map with the app, and now I can configure it. It's a new item now in my content. I can go back to it anytime and configure it, and now I have the configuration panel. Uh, I can change the title, I can change the color scheme, I can add a splash screen if we want. Let's go ahead and uh, do that. And this is where you might add some caveats or instructions. Uh, please uh, use at uh, your, uh, your own uh, risk or whatever you want to put. And um, then you can toggle things on the toolbar. What do you want a legend? We don't have any bookmarks, so we can take that off. Um, you get the idea. Once we save it, we can view it here. And also these changes are saved with our application. So the first thing that I had was a little uh, splash screen. We close that. And I've just got the tools that I configured and enabled here, which show up here on the left-hand side. And there's a couple of different ways we can go through them. So a uh, really easy way to configure applications. And it just goes on from here. These are really powerful. Source code is available, but you don't have to touch that. Uh, these are easy to configure and will make heroes out of every one of us. You know, I mentioned in the very first section about stakeholders and making sure that stakeholders have uh, the information that they need. These templates can be a great way to do that. Um, if you have a, you know, a C-level executive or somebody in management who uh, needs something for a meeting or a public uh, forum or something like that, you can crank these things out super fast and just send them a URL that they can open on an iPad or on a laptop or on their phone, and you can get them the information that they need. 
really, really useful tools. I just wanted to, to you know, kind of stress that before we move on. So the next section, and we're, we're getting a little short on time here, so I'm going to try to speed through this a little bit, is to actually invite members. And you, know, you can invite them one at a time, obviously, using an ArcGIS on uh, login or uh, by pre-establishing some logins for them. Um, you can uh, also streamline the process a little bit um, by, uh, let's see here, we can establish their role and there are several different roles available in the organization and we'll look at that here in the next slide. Um, you can use enterprise logins. This is probably going to be the best option for a lot of people. Uh, we support uh, you know, connecting to LDAP systems and all that kind of stuff, uh, uh, Windows Active Directory as well. Um, you can also use some of the built-in roles. We have administrator, publisher, and user. Those are fairly straightforward. Uh, administrators can do anything, in including uh, bringing in new people, configuring the home page. Uh, publishers are able to add content to the, the portal or the organization. Users can consume it. Uh, you can also create custom roles. Uh, these are based on templates, and they can be created and modified by the administrator. Um, and did you want to say something about credit limits there? Uh, the, you can set their credit limits right, yeah, you, you can within set the, the organization. That's a new thing, um, relatively new. It's been rolled out recently. So as an administrator, I can save from someone from themselves you know, before they cash the entire United States of some you know, really detailed uh, data set online. You can actually set it up and say, whoa there, you know, if you're going to do that, you're going to use more credits than you're allowed to use. Uh, so you can actually set a cap on how many credits somebody's allowed to use in the organization. Um, now the privileges, here's a quick little matrix, kind of shows you what everybody can do. Uh, join and create groups, you know, that's available to anybody. Um, so you know, if somebody's working on a project, uh, they can create new groups around that project. Um, we've already talked about that a little bit. Uh, I'm just going to kind of breeze through here. One of the things I do want to stress, though, is that you can encourage people, uh, probably very strongly, to make sure that they have a, a good profile, especially if they're a publisher. Um, if there's somebody that's actually curating or adding content in the organization or the portal, they really should have a good profile. Uh, here we're looking at Kent Taylor. You know, Kent uh, has kind of done the bare minimum here. He's not really uh, putting much effort into it. Rick's doing a little better. At least we know that Rick is the uh, assistant director for technical services. Um, our colleague Jim Harries has added a picture and he's given a little background on himself. Uh, maybe a little wordy. He's got a little scroll bar there on the side that's kind of scrolling down pretty far. Uh, we may want to encourage him to be a little more concise in uh, his family history there. And then, uh, but now we're looking at Carrie Trapasso. Uh, here we see another one of those branding options. You know, we can tell that, uh, you know, Carrie is the uh, GIS technical lead. She works for the uh, Pennsylvania Department of Conservation and Natural Resources, a good user profile. This goes back to something we've touched on a couple times already. <clears throat> so you can encourage people to do this just by going through their profile and you know, adding a thumbnail, a name in their email, their correct contact information. They can put a bio, and uh, Bernie can give you more information on this, and I believe there's a blog post that you put out on how to, how to do a good profile, and embed some HTML, uh, some... Uh, things to make the profile look a little bit better. And then once you have people uh, in the organization, obviously you can kind of move them around. They can be members of different groups, uh, depending on where their workflows take them in the organization or what it is that they need to support or what it is they need to contribute to. Um, and groups kind of keep all their stuff compartmentalized, but also allow them to share with other people when it's relevant. Um, so it's kind of a, a, a cross-cutting thing. And, you know, Bernie mentioned this before, pre-populating groups with meaningful content and with the users that belong to that group will go a long way into getting them engaged in the organization and uh, actually becoming contributing, you know, useful members of the organization instead of just looking at it every now and then. And do you want to do uh, a little de quick demonstration or do you want to sure. keep moving? Sure, shoot it over. All right. All right, so uh, Jeff is absolutely right. The Virgo in me wouldn't let go of that botched uh, embed. <laughs> so um, what I did was I figured out what the problem was, and the problem was I neglected, this is something I could have said earlier, but I neglected to make it the proper width for my fixed width web page, which is about <gasps> 880, and also we got all that gibberish up there because I forgot the little angle bracket up there. Somehow it disappeared. Let's save this. And uh, let's go back to my sample and refresh and ah. 
So not a much better. My God, let's hear it. Now, uh, let's see, there's something else I wanted to pick up or I've already forgotten. Oh, I know, uh, custom uh, roles. Let's go ahead and yes. take a look at that. So I'm the admin for my organization, and in the organization settings is where I can set custom roles. So to do that, I just create a role. I've already created some custom ones here. I click create a role, and let's say um, I'm looking for a data administrator role or author. So I'm going to call this data admin and author. And I'll give a description, and this is the uh, person uh, responsible for all sorts of stuff. And then I choose a template. And these are little templates that are preset for some role. So data admin and author is probably closest to the data curator. So I'll choose that, and here's the data curator template. Now, the things that are checked on are obviously things that this role enables. And if I want to add some things, I can, I can do that. Uh, if I want to remove some things, I can do that as well. And once I've finished uh, checking these boxes and deciding what I want, I save the role, and I now have a custom role. So it says it was saved. And to assign this to people in my organization, I just go up to the user. And uh, I've only got me in my organization, so I can't change my role from admin. But it would just appear in the drop-down list, and I assign that to users. You can also assign this to users on the way into organization automatically. Back to you, Jeff. Uh, actually, oh, wait, this is me. You're up okay. for uh, Section right. 8. I'm up for something here. Uh, OK. So let's move on to Section 8, which is about connecting with your enterprise systems and workflows. So some of you may have lots of things in your enterprise and your organization that you might need to think about connecting to. And I mentioned uh, SAP and other things. We're not going to even touch that here because those are different problems that require some specific attention or understanding to figure out how to integrate and things like that. But an easy thing that you can do in your organization is just try to think about workflows that your organization, this portal, can serve. And there's lots of different types of workflows. Some of those are for GIS professionals. Uh, some of those will be to enable your workforce out in the field with collector and dashboard. Explorer is a native app for viewing things, and uh, we now have Navigator uh, and um, some other tools that are available. Uh, Esri Maps for Office, actually it's ArcGIS Maps for Office now, will enable people that are using Office products, especially Excel, to use this. And we also uh, recently announced a uh, plugin uh, for Adobe Creative uh, Suite. So you can enable designers in your organization to leverage your web maps as well. So these are the ways that you can extend the reach of your organization into other areas. Now, another one is uh, another way to extend your reach is to open your data. And there's been a lot of discussion about open data portals recently uh, here and elsewhere. Um, the city of Los Angeles recently rolled out a uh, you know, a big implementation of that to engage people in the community. Um, now, here we're looking at a couple of uh, examples of what an open data portal actually looks like. Um, it's uh, something that actually is included as part of your organization or your portal. Uh, so if you decide you want to create an op open data portal, it's already, con it's already there. You just have to uh, basically enable it. And uh, here's an example of uh, my city, Houston, and uh, City of Houston GIS. Uh, their portal is actually, they spent quite a bit of time con configuring that. Looks really nice. Uh, and you may be asking, well, how do I do that? Well, if you go into the um, organization administration page, you'll see down at the bottom in the settings, there's an open data tab. And if you click on that, all you have to do is click a button and enable your open data portal. Uh, it really is that easy. And then you designate the participating groups. Now, one of the things you may want to do is set, set aside one or two groups in your organization specifically for open data. So if you have ArcGIS server services or if you have tile packages or whatever it is that you want to share out there, uh, you can put that in one group and then use that group as uh, the container for all the things that are going to be in your open data portal. Now, once you have that, you just go through the steps for configuring the site, very similar to the steps that Bernie went through to configure the ArcGIS, uh, the organization home. Uh, you go through some WYSIWYG editors, and you kind of click and paste, and you establish your brand on the open data portal, and all the things that we've gone through, you make that available publicly, and you're done. That's it. So uh, again, I just want you guys to understand that this is something that is contained by default in your organization, and you can use it at, uh, at your leisure. Let's take a look at a uh, 
real quick example of one. This is City of Houston that we highlighted there. Beautiful looking site, great branding, we love to see this. Here's their link to their open data site, and this is it. And uh, somebody give me a topic to search for. Bayou. No. <laughs> it's the Bayou bike City. Bike packs, okay, so let's hope they have bike paths. No data sets. Dogs. Dogs. Good one. Okay, I'm searching for parcels. <laughs> All right. Oh, there it is. Okay. So uh, here it is. So we've identified something. And uh, I can click on this and I can get more information about it. I got the description. I've got a table. I can even apply filters to this. And I can extract just pieces of information from the table. This has got, uh, this would take a little bit to populate, but um, you get the idea. The other cool thing about open data, what it's meant to serve is kind of people outside your organization. They could be entrepreneurs, they could be um, people that are building custom apps. An interesting thing, uh, the other day I interviewed a gal from uh, Google Waze. And what Waze is doing, Waze is a crowdsource traffic thing. They're going to open data sites from GIS users, finding the ones that publish live traffic information, and they're incorporating that into their Waze product. Cool. So that's an example of how by publishing your data through open data, it can be leveraged in lots of different ways. These are services that are in your organization that you might use in many different ways, but through the open data site that can be accessed as spreadsheets, as KML, as shapefile, you can also provide access to these in various different uh, APIs, GeoJSON for developer geeks, uh, REST services for everybody else, and you can even open this in ArcGIS.com web map. So it's an excellent site that enables you to um, expose your data in many more different ways. So it's a configurable app, it's free, doesn't cost any credits, uh, and it's a great way to expose content in multiple ways, and you can have multiple open data sites per organization, which is kind of cool. So, which brings us to step number 10. We're almost across the finish line here. So step number 10 is you've got this great, vibrant organization. You've got users, they're happy, the great information products. You're extending your reach and the value of what you do as GIS professionals, but your responsibility doesn't end there. You need to monitor and manage properly what's going on. Now, over time, we've provided lots of better management tools directly into the admin framework. You can explore those as an administrator. I do want to point out some other tools that are available. GeoJob is one of our very good business partners, and they provide some admin tools uh, that I think are of interest to you, and I recommend you take a look at. They're available through the marketplace. A couple of them are free, one subscription, and no, I don't get commissions, but we actually had contracted with GeoJob to provide some specific tools to help educators because they have different workflow needs to support classroom use and students coming in and out all the time. Uh, so they're a, a close partner of Esri, and they built some really great admin, admin tools that fill in some of the gaps that Esri leaves right now, and they're free, and I recommend that you use them. Everything from uh, editing tags kind of globally across your organization, correcting tag misspellings and global replacing to you name it, lots of tools. There's really no reason not to get the GeoJob tools, seriously. And they're free. Marketplace.arcgis.com. Search for GeoJob. Uh, there's other places to find content. Uh, Esri solution engineers have built tools to support what they do with customer engagements. And these tools are available on the Esri GitHub repo. You can run them directly from there. Some of these are more, more mature than others, shall I say. Uh, so some of them, I mean, they all work, uh, but uh, some of them kind of, there wasn't a lot of time put into the user experience and things like that, which is why in general the Geo Job tools are, are great, but these are interesting tools as well, and you can explore those on GitHub. You can also download this, and uh, you can extend these on your own. Final step is you've done all this great work, you need to keep the wheels turning, and you don't want your organization to go fallow. You want to keep it uh, living on and on and on. So a lot of that is just about promoting your organization, finding ways to promote what you do, expose it to others throughout your uh, organization that you belong to, other divisions, other departments, to kind of keep that support going and keep it vibrant and keep it live. And with that, uh, Jeff and I are happy to take questions and answers. And the last thing I'll say is, like, promoting your organization should be easy if you do all the things that we've gone through well. Story maps are a great way to expose what you do. Right? Exactly. I mean, if, you're, if you understand what your, what your constituents are looking for, uh, what makes them successful, what workflows they need to support, and you give that to them, they're going to be engaged in your organization, and it will be successful. Sweet. And, oh, go ahead. 
I was going to say we just have a couple of minutes for questions if you yes. want to fire a couple of quick ones off. Okay, so the question was, and before everybody leaves, I'm supposed to remind everybody to fill out the online form, which I think you know where it is, and I think we've taken care of all the obligations. Your question yes. was about how do I improve the performance of my services? And the only way I can answer that is by saying it depends. Um, are you publishing them from your own ArcGIS for server? Okay, so you are. So one thing I'd recommend is, um, looking at uh, maybe making those services more granular. Maybe they're trying to publish too much information. Uh, another thing could be to look at uh, things like symbolization or maybe you need to beef up your server. There's too many variables there for me to answer concisely, uh, but uh, there's it's, lots of different ways you can. It's really a shame the showcase is closed because there's a whole, there was a whole slew of people down there that could really help you with that. I know, I almost said that and then I realized I the showcase is closed. So, but there is a lot of uh, information online um, and also um, in the user forums uh, on GeoNet, uh, I would encourage you just to kind of search through there. There's some uh, community resources that can probably help you uh, get all the performance you can out of what you have, at least. I think we have time for one more before we need to allow the other folks to come in. Any other questions? All right, Jeff and I will be hanging out outside if you want to catch us, email us, uh, whatever, with your questions. And thanks for coming. We hope uh, this was a valuable session for you. Thanks a lot.